Hi, welcome to Wellness Wednesday. It is gorgeous outside, so I hope you're getting outside and getting some of that beautiful sunshine today. We are excited to come to you live today on Facebook with Pam Zanakis. Um, and today we're going to talk about prediabetes. Pam, if you want to introduce yourself. Yeah, I'm Pam Zanakis. I am the coordinator of the diabetes program locally in Westminster, Maryland at Carroll Hospital, part of the LifeBridge system. And I am a registered dietitian and a certified diabetes care and education specialist. <laughs> the long but title. But today title. we're going to be talking about pre-diabetes. Right. Um, Tasha and I were just talking about this actually. So it's a thing. Um, it's a thing. Um, it's not the same as what we used to call borderline diabetes, which was not a thing. Um, that was sort of, you have diabetes, so we're just not going to talk about it. Um, so pre-diabetes, um, there's a definition and everything. Um, it's basically, you know, if you get your lab work done, which of your, if you're at a, at a certain age, you should do this annually. Um, it basically means your fasting glucose is between 100 and 125. Um, it's diabetes, the whole process of insulin resistance. Um, basically, type 2 diabetes occurs um, not because you don't necessarily have enough insulin. The whole issue with type 2 diabetes is that you need more insulin than you should. And that doesn't happen overnight. Um, it happens a lot with age. Um, I actually just got a phone call yesterday from someone who was telling me that they needed diabetes services. So I was sending an order over to their doctor for them, but it was funny. They were like, and I'm not overweight. Um, you know, <laughs> like, like I get it, like, you know, but, um, you know, diabetes is, is an equal opportunity, uh, <laughs> threat to all of us, um, you know, the longer you live, which is the goal still, we're all still trying to live longer, um, you know, the more this is on, on your radar. And one of the things that I wanted to do today with Tasha was actually walk through the diabetes risk assessment. Um, and the reason I'm doing this is that um, there is a lot of bias in healthcare, unfortunately. And, um, you know, we can't always rely on um, our providers to give us all the information that maybe maybe we need. So we know that prediabetes is underdiagnosed in this country, like incredibly. So we have a problem that um, right now in this country is estimated it affects about 37% um, of adults. And that's not old people, that's people over 20. Um, you're an adult by this standard if you're over 20 years old. So that means 37% um, of them. So over a third of US adults have prediabetes. And because this is so shocking and maybe even un unbelievable as this is landing on you where, wherever you are, um, you know, it used to be we said 90% of people didn't know that they had it. Now I think this statistic has been updated to like 87% of people don't know they have it. So, and part of it is it affects basically well people, you know, people in their 40s that are starting to put a little bit more weight around the middle. That's one of the signs of insulin resistance. Um, there's a whole lot that goes into insulin resistance that we don't need to cover um, on today's topic. I could come back another day and talk about it. Another day, okay. <laughs> but basically, it's something that happens as you get older. Um, a lot of us think, you know, we, we get older so we get fatter. And, and, and even though objectively that may seem like the case, you know, it's definitely correlated. Um, really, the more insulin resistant you are, the more likely you are to deposit weight around the middle, the harder it is for you to lose weight. And a lot of that comes from the aging process. Our body just isn't as equipped. Um, anyone over the age of 40 is, it will not be surprised to hear that your body just can't do everything it used just to. It doesn't bounce back like it used Full to. Stop. Right, right. It's just, it's so, so it shouldn't be shocking that some of the insides aren't exactly pull it, pulling their weight the way they should. So basically, um, you know, if you do get lab work, I would strongly recommend that you check out your fasting glucose and if it's between 100 and 125, you have options. Um, there's also the diabetes screening tool, which I'm going to go through today. And a lot of um, diabetes prevention programs will let people in just if they screen high enough on the screening. So even if your lab work, um, you know, doesn't indicate a problem, 
Um, you know, we, we have to have standards. This is healthcare. We've all learned a lot in the last couple of years, though, about how standards can change. And, um, you know, and, and nature doesn't do anything. And like even numbers, you know, there's, I mean, you could look at it and be like, well, what is the difference between a fasting glucose of 99 and a fasting glucose of 100? Um, technically, it means if you have fasting glucose of 100, you can get admitted into a diabetes prevention program <laughs> if, if that's the thing. Um, they can be very, very, very successful. Um, so we have a partner regional partnership with St. Agnes, which is running their diabetes prevention program, um, uh, virtually. And then the Carroll County health department actually does it virtually. And I believe that they use a virtual platform where you take pictures of your food and you submit it, um, and you get feedback from, from a coach. It basically is just a way to help you help you stay in line. Um, because we do know that we do better when someone's watching. So it sort of sets that up for you. Um, I also just want to go over the guidelines. So basically if you're in this bracket, um, or if you're not in this bracket, but worried you're going to be in this bracket, um, the guidelines are pretty, pretty simple. It's two and a half hours of exercise a week and, um, it's 150 minutes. Um, it helps if you break it down into smaller increments. So we don't want you necessarily doing a two and a half hour walk once, once, once a week. And that's because of the way our body, uh, the way the insulin resistance works. We know that any kind of exercise actually helps reduce your insulin resistance for 48 hours after you do it. So it can be helpful to break it down, um, which is really contrary to when I first started doing this, you know, we used to really um, overemphasize exercise that was in these huge chunks of time. Um, but we've since learned that actually breaking it down and just walking is enough. And, um, you know, I really, when I coach people, I really like figure out a way to do it at work, uh, you know, figure out a way to get some exercise at work. Um, lots of us workplaces that have stairs, you can run the stairs. Um, there are some studies that show that um, getting your heart rate up for at least 20 seconds um, twice a day can be very beneficial to reducing insulin resistance. But there's also walking at lunch. Um, there's options for walking meetings. If you meet a lot with people, especially just one-on-one, -on -one, um, doing that in a walking setting, that was one of the um, Healthy America gu guidelines published a couple of years ago. Um, you know, and it's also, you know, it's interesting also from like a workplace perspective, because anyone who's ever had a teenager knows that your teenager will tell you more stuff when you're in the car because there's no eye contact. <laughs> right. So when you're having difficult conversations, it is it is easier when you're both, you know, forward forward facing. So I'm going to go ahead and um, try to share my screen here for a second to um, look at the prediabetes risk test. Can you see this, Tasha? Yes. Okay. So this is on a website. Um, do I have prediabetes.org and you can find websites on um, the state of Maryland has an excellent one that's through the American Diabetes Association. Those websites actually prompt you to add your email and then they will email you um, programs that are in your jurisdiction in your in your area. So if you're listening to this in another part of the country, that's the route I would end up going. Um, I tend to recommend this one because it's anonymous. And sometimes people are weird, like, they, you know, of course, if the test comes out, you are at low risk of prediabetes, it's like tell the whole world. But um, in case it does say, you know, maybe you are a little bit apprehensive of who's going to know this information. So um, I'm going to see if I can go back with this and see. So this is what the site looks like. Do I have prediabetes.org? It gives you some, um, some access to some programs. I haven't quite tested this out. And it also has some healthy lifestyle tips. Um, so take the risk test, click this, and the diabetes resource, the diabetes um, risk test for prediabetes, it actually is a little bit complicated. So I do recommend doing it online instead of on paper um, because it'll do some calculations. But the first thing it's gonna ask you is your age. And this is an important thing because most people, once you hit 65, regardless of how well you have lived your life, you are at an increased risk for prediabetes just because of your age. Um, and again, if you see stuff about, um, you know, do we really need to worry about prediabetes? A lot of that, um, depending on your age, may or may not apply to you. If you have someone who is 95 years old, um, 
you know, no, we don't necessarily need to worry about prediabetes in that person because we worry about prediabetes because we want to avoid diabetes. Prediabetes is reversible if it's caught early enough with basic lifestyle change. So we worry about it in younger people, especially, um, you know, if the idea is that you're not going to worry about your prediabetes, think about what's that, what that's saying, because it's basically saying, we don't think you're going to be here in 10 or 15 years. Mm -hmm. So if you feel like that applies to you in, in all honesty, then, then yeah, but if not, like get on it. So um, age is an important one. I'm going to just go ahead. Well, I'm going to go ahead and um, I'm going to show what happens if I hit 60 plus. Um, next is gonna be family history. Do you have a family history? So I'm gonna say no to this um, and then hit next. And this is just for you to understand like what goes into a prediabetes assessment. Um, have you ever been diagnosed with high blood pressure? I'm gonna say no. Um, and what is your race? I'm gonna say, um, I'm gonna say black or African-American. Um, next. Are you active? I'm gonna say no. And men are more likely than women to have undiagnosed pre-diabetes. Um, and part of that is because men tend to go to the doctor less. So I'm gonna say woman here. Have you ever been diagnosed with gestational diabetes? Gestational diabetes is a condition that happens, um, especially if you're older when you have your, your child. And again, it mostly has to do with age, you know, it, the weight's correlated, but the age is really the driver there because um, societal norms aside, we're really physically meant to be pushing out these kids when we're like teenagers. Um, that's what we're going <laughs> <about>. to <laughs> So, and this is tell your more, tell us more about yourself. This is your, um, this is where we get to your weight. And this is why it's easier to do it online. So I'm going to do five, five, and then I'm going to do ideal body weight, which would be 125 for somebody, a woman who's um, five, five. And this person is at low risk for pre, pre diabetes, which is, which is good, but it'll take you to see your tips and it'll talk to you about what it, what it is. Um, so it's interesting to see, you can do this test different ways. Um, for those of you that are interested also, if you have any sort of concern with cardiovascular disease, there's also a quiz with cardiovascular disease that you can, um, you can ma manipulate things. But that person came up with, with a low risk. So basically if you score high enough on that, um, so if that person's weight was a little bit higher, they probably would have um, screened out. So it's something you can play around with. If you are not at risk for prediabetes, that's great. Congratulations. Do the test in another five years or if anything changes. Um, but otherwise, keep in mind, if you're in this category or if you're just getting older, like we all are every year, um, and you're looking to make some changes, the best two changes we, we can recommend are really getting 150 minutes of exercise a week and losing, if you have weight to lose, start with five to 7% of your body weight. Um, five to 7%, if you, if you do it the opposite way and kind of subtract it from 100 just to make the math easier, if you take your current weight and multiply it by 0.9, um, 0.93, that, yeah, just look at, I, I can do some, some math in my head. If you multiply <laughs> it by 0.93, that'll give you a goal weight. And, um, and again, if your doctor has told you you have pre-diabetes, pre figure out what that goal weight is because we are looking more and more at medication options. And if you lose that weight and you um, are able to do that exercise and you're still in the pre-diabetes range, um, you should be um, evaluated to see if a medication might not be the best choice. Um, typically, oh, we would use... Um, the first medication that's used in diabetes now, which is a drug called metformin. And again, your risk needs to be assessed. The younger you are, 
the more important it is to stay on top of this because we want you to live a really long time. And when we think about um, diabetes, uh, you know, it's the same risk factors. It's being overweight or getting older, um, having a sedentary lifestyle, which applies to a lot of us, um, certain races, um, Hispanic, Asian Americans, especially. Actually, there's a different criteria for Asian Americans because, um, or Asians, I suppose. We're talking in America, so I'm using using Asian Americans, um, but um, because their risk is so much higher and we don't know why, it's just, it has to be just a genetic component. So, um, so yeah, so looking, looking at your risk and seeing what changes you can make and being honest with yourself, because if you legit can't exercise, then there are medication options, um, but nobody can do anything about this until they know that it's a problem. So, you know, we're really working at a system-wide level to work to get this diagnosed and get this treated like a problem that is treatable because it is, it is. There's, you know, it's not like, oh, what do we do about it? Um, and most people that need to lose a little bit of weight and exercise more, know that they need to lose a little bit of weight and exercise more. So we're partnering with their provider and knowing that their provider is looking out for them and um, helping them stick to their goals um, can be a really, really valuable change um, and one we can sort of lean into to get this trend turned around. There's a lot on reversing diabetes out there. And aside from some weight loss surgeries, there's not a lot of evidence to say that it can be done. Um, but prediabetes is in the exact opposite boat. And sometimes just like getting that wake up call is all that somebody needs to, to make the changes that or make, make prioritize the changes that they know they need to make. So do you have any Thank questions? You so much. Well, so yeah. So I wanted to mention you did, you mentioned like the diabetes prevention program um, so there, that's uh, available. The health department does that. Uh, the Carroll County government also offers um, the diabetes uh, self-management class. Um, and actually, Leslie just messaged us and said that they actually have a workshop beginning next Thursday. Oh, that's great. Um, let's see. They'll meet for two and a half hours a week for six weeks, and it's free. Um, she actually put the link in the comments. So if you're interested in doing that, um, that's available. Hi, Leslie. <laughs> um so that's available um, that's fantastic i don't usually think of that for pre prediabetes and it, unfortunately because you know at the diabetes center we we focus on diabetes exclusively but that's a great program because um it really can give people the support and the tools we need to help hold ourselves accountable um or if we can't hold ourselves accountable find somebody who will hold yeah, us accountable help. and somebody to help us along the way yeah and to getting those tools i always feel like even when you're not sure just do it right like putting a little bit more tools in your toolbox for you to have um and have access to it um and she said it's in the evening from 5 30 to 8. So, oh that's nice um, and, it's, and, it, and it's virtual i'm pretty sure and it's so virtual so you can do it after yeah. work after hours um, thank you, Leslie, for sharing that with us. Um, and I would really encourage you if you have, if you can do that, see if you can get a, a friend to do it with you, because that really does help sort of, um, like hold, hold you to the task. And there's somebody to exercise with, um, there's the Walt Carroll program, which is having a, another kickoff, I believe coming up or something like that. So, so we had, um, our Walt Carroll kickoff at the mall, but we do have, um, Walking at the mall, we have walking at the Y, we have walking in different in towns. Like so we have one in Tony Town, I believe it's Tony Town. Um, and we also have Fitness Fridays that are going to be um, the first Friday of the month at the mall. And then every third Friday of the month is also going to be virtual. Uh, so we are giving you some opportunities. So there's actually one this Friday um, at 10 a.m. It is virtual and it's yoga. Um, so just getting your body moving and that's the biggest thing is like, you know, just, um, moving your body, just, you know, okay. So you can't run a marathon. I can't run a marathon. I can't, you know, like I do avoid steps. Like I like, you know, I know I need to work on that. Um, I know it's something I need to work on, um, is, is, is utilizing steps or, um, 
actually one of uh one day at work a couple of us were walking and i'm like let's do the steps and we're like oh my gosh like <laughs> but it is like you get your heart rate moving and just moving and we only did it for 15 minutes but so we did it 15 minutes in the morning and then in the afternoon so it was 30 minutes for that day but we did we set a timer and we're like we're gonna do this i mean and but having that other person to do it with you definitely makes it better uh leslie also said that they're offering incentives for people who complete the program so oh, that's nice so and that you know something to get people sometimes you have to motivate people to do that so if you're interested in doing that you can reach out to leslie or you can look on that the website the link that she sent so Thank you, Pam. Always, always such a wealth of knowledge and sharing all your expertise with us. We appreciate you um, sharing your stuff. Thank Good you. Good to see you. Until next time, Tasha. Until next time. <laughs> and everyone on Facebook world, have a great day. Get outside, get moving outside, and we'll see you next week. Okay, great. Bye.